it's good to see all of you. Not just some of you. It's good to see each and every one of you. Um, so how's your spring been? Right? Uh, sometimes it's uh, like you just can't find things to, uh, to celebrate for. Uh, but I want to tell you, there are some things that we can celebrate for. You ready to hear some of those lists? Um, this morning... This is making my socks roll up and down. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's it's it's. Uh, we've been praying for this this sister of Miss Christie by the name of Kelly. Kelly has attended our church services a few times. Uh, it's a quite the the journey for her to get here from where she lives around the El Reno Yukon area. But the last few months, um, I believe that God is using circumstances to draw people to him, and Kelly is somebody today, as she, as Laura and Miss Christie are watching her baptism today in the Yukon area um, uh, churches today, and so we can celebrate that as we pray for Kelly, Kelly is being baptized today. You know, it's interesting that sometimes we don't necessarily see with our own two eyes the fruit, or even get to benefit us personally, but I want us to kind of shift our minds just a little bit to know that uh, if the kingdom benefits, we benefit. Amen. 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 I know that that sometimes that's a that's a hard thing for us to, to swallow. Uh, another thing that I want you to do: last week we introduced you to uh, a, a special friend of ours. Her name is Leah Ben. Uh, we have invited her this summer to become our summer music ministry intern and so miss leah ben is right there so make her feel welcome she'll be with us for the rest of the summer uh she's got some other obligations she is a student at snu and uh she'll be a senior next year and she's a music ministry major and we are so glad if nobody else is i am glad that she is here she is at uh, and she's leading us in worship, and she did a, a mighty job uh, this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Leah, uh, for that. Also, another thing that we can celebrate is um, Rochelle is cancer-free. And not only is Rochelle cancer-free, but we have been on our knees praying for, the, for Dusty Langford's sister, uh, Shirley, and she is now considered to be cancer-free. So, yeah. Cool things to be thankful about. You know, when I say, uh, how's your spring been? Uh, there's some things to celebrate, okay? There's a, th there's a mind shift uh, uh, that I think that we can, uh, we can think about. So, uh, the beginning of this week, I posted a post. Uh, and I, I'm overwhelmed with the, the text the personal messages, the phone calls, and also the comments made underneath that thread. And it's just simply, the simple post was this, some of you guys had seen it, to finish this particular sentence. I regret, and so there's a lot of people, a lot of people that I think that that hit the nail on the head uh, for some uh, of you, that uh, maybe that you'd be living, some of them were funny. I'd like to share some funny ones with you, okay? Some people that would text message me, even post on the comment, uh, Austin, my uh, brother-in-law, says, permanently damaging my voice badly by screaming while working at the haunted house. Yeah, uh, he still sings pretty good, though. Uh, Tara Baumhoff, uh, she, she writes, not eating dessert first. Words to live by, yeah, yeah. My other brother-in-law, uh, Cassandra's brother, he says, getting on that horseback. Now, let me just kind of give you a little background. Uh, whenever Cassandra and I were just newly married, we would visit her parents uh, quite often. We lived in the same town, and they lived uh, in a um, they lived in a rural community, rural area, and they had you know uh, fields surrounding their houses. And somebody had rented the space in the, right next to their house, and they put horses on there. And so the horses were were very tame. And so they would always come up to you, and you know you, that, that you would be able to pet them and stuff like that. So my brother-in-law, Russell, you've seen him play drums here, and he, he is like sky high. He is six foot six. I mean, he is head and shoulders over everybody else. And so I would think, you know, you're six foot six. You could easily get on this horse, 
Uh, we didn't saddle this horse up. We didn't bridle the horse up. We didn't put anything in, in his mouth to kind of uh, rein him in or anything like that. The so Russell, he climbs up with a little bit of encouragement, encouraging him to get up on the horse. So the horse just, it's almost like that it's like something that's supposed to happen. So the, he gets up on side of the, the rails of the fence where the fence is holding him up, and the horse just like, Walks up there, just like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. You know, and just like snuggles up next to the fence. And so Russell's like, okay, he knows what he's doing. I may not, but he knows. And so he just throws his long legs over that horse. And as soon as his bottom hits that horse, that ho the, the horse, I'm telling the story wrong, by the way. The story really goes, I got on the horse first. And the, and the horse flung me into, like, I didn't last maybe two seconds. And he, he took a turn, and, and I was in, in the dirt. Russell wants to, to get on it, and he gets on it. And the horse, as soon as he gets on it, he turns his head to wide open spaces. And the only thing that you see is hands flailing, feet flying, and he's going like this. And all of a sudden, his big six-foot-six six body lands upon his shoulder, and there is an ER visit. And he has separated and broke his shoulder. So his regret is this, getting on that horseback. Uh, there's somebody that text messaged me and says, my regret is eating Taco Bell today. <laughs> no more details, please. Right? Uh, also, uh, my, my cousin uh, text messaged me. She said, uh, the time I dyed my hair black, also, probably should have skipped that baby oil mixed with iodine when laying in the Florida sun on vacation. I, I, I can't get that image out of my mind. And she also says, also laser hair removal. Uh, all right. So, you know, there's some, so, some other things that people have text messages that, that they regret. There, Some of them are funny, but some of them become really serious. Uh, a lot of them have to do with family. Next Sunday is, is Father's Day. I just want to kind of give some of you children a little bit of heads up. You know, Father's Day is coming up. You know, maybe you need to recognize and uh, uh, I just learned from experience, guys. Uh, so, uh, Tony, Tony White, he posts something about family here. She says, not spending more time with family before they're gone. That's a good, that's a regret. Uh, Brian White, uh, we lived with Brian, Brian from Visai. Uh, now in Woodward, he says, not spending time with my brother Neil. Uh, another one, Christy Miller says, straying away from church and it affecting my children and my life. He says, I pray one day that they'll come back just as I did. And there's other people that would say, you know, losing my wife, not, to, not, to, not paying more attention to the wisdom of my father or my grandfather. You know, I think that, I think that there's a few here that would say that you would have some type of regrets. Obviously, there's people that have posted, you know, this anti-regret type of mentality, and I think that that's great. I, I'm not, I'm not opposed uh, to people that say, you know, no, no regrets, right? I mean, regrets. Uh, no, no regrets at all. You know, even that, even that terrible tattoo, you know, that nobody is ever able to see, and I'm always having to, to, to cover it up. Not me, somebody. Um, so. There's some people that said, no, no regrets, only mistakes that will help you learn. And I'm, I'm great with that. I'm absolutely great with that. But I do believe that I live with a people, and I believe that I'm worshiping with a people that some of you corporately would say that there is regrets that you live with on a daily basis. There are certain things that it's just like a, a VHS tape rewinding and being played over and over and over again in your mind. And you can't outlive it. You can't run away from it. No amount of prayer seems to cover it up. And it just seems like over and over and over again that you have to live with the consequences of that particular regret. Gary, I'm so glad to see you. Brother. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's about to bust out the seams. He's ready for me to say something. He's just going to really get in and say amen. And I miss hearing that. Okay. So this is probably something that you won't say an amen to, Jerry, because I think that this is a, this is kind of unnerving. And it, if it doesn't, if it's not unnerving to you, maybe that you've come to grips with this particular passage of scripture. Uh, 
But as I read our passage of scripture today in 1 Samuel chapter 15, there's a phrase that's said twice in the same situation that God regretted. I don't know about you, but that's somewhat unnerving because I serve a God that is perfect. I serve a God that is holy. And sometimes whenever we say God regretted, it seems as if that we allow God in our own minds to, to make a mistake. And it's unnerving to us to think about this holy God that is perfect and has our best interest in mind to hear that phrase, God regretted. So I'm working on a sermon for next week. I'm not going to give too much away, but I think it ties close, and I want it to be drilled into either the front or the back of your mind somewhere where it will come back up all week long. I'm going to invite you just to walk along uh, with me uh, because here's where God regretted. So it's this bridge where I'm going to build this bridge between this Sunday and next Sunday. So be thinking about why God regretted to begin with. God regretted because he, he, he uh, allowed the voices, the voices of a desire that was not in God's plan, he allowed that to happen. And so... What they asked for, what the people of Israel asked for a king. And here's the thing. It wasn't in God's design. It wasn't in God's plan to follow a king, to place kingship over the nation of Israel. Really what he wanted to do, he wanted to lead his people by being God and Lord and the king of kings over this particular nation. But the people kind of looked over at the, uh, uh, at the other side of the fence, and they thought, hey, it's greener over there. Uh, other nations have kings. These other people have kings. And so we want to be like them. We want to be known as great. We want to know, be known as great people amongst a great people. And so what sets, what, what sets them up is that they have a king. So give us a king. And it, this is the thing that I think that... I want you to, to be ringing in your ears is this. When the people of God cease being something other than the world, we stop offering anything to the world. Let me say that again. Whenever the people of God cease being something other than the world, we no longer have anything to offer the world. Can you guys get that in your mind? Is that too deep for you? Do I need to say it one more time? I should have just put it up here. But whenever the people of God cease being something set apart other than what the world offers, we no longer offer anything to the world. So church, we're set apart. We're meant to be set apart. We're meant to be separate than the world. Although we live in it, we need to offer something to the world, the church, the people of God need to offer something to the world on the menu than what the world's already offering. And then whenever we start doing that, if we start doing that, because we're tempted to do that, we no longer have anything to offer to the world. So I want you to be uh, invite you. Uh, here it is, First Samuel chapter fifteen. I'm gonna. I'm going to walk around in a couple of passages. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I invite you to, to read it, uh, the whole thing. It's a great story. Um, last week we talked about uh, this, this prophet by the name of Eli, and he had these two sons that you guys are going to name your children or your grandchildren, uh, you know, Hophnius and Phineas. He loved those names, you know. And, uh, and they were just kind of doing wrong, and they were kind of uh, uh, backwards in, in their thinking of how to be representation of God. And then there was this prophet by the name of Samuel that was raised up, and Samuel continues to be the vocal mouthpiece of God. And here is Samuel. Samuel has anointed this king by the name of Saul. In verse 10, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says this, The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all night long. I think that there was some regret that Samuel was facing. Let's keep on going. 
if you could skip down uh, to verse 34, it says, Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to the house of Gibeth of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he made Saul o uh, king over Israel. Your version might say the word regret again. This is the New Revised Standard. I, I stepped it up a little bit, uh, Dylan. Uh, not the New International Version today. Uh, chapter 16, moving on. It says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out, and I will send you to Jesse, to Beth Bethlehem. For I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I pray that it's useful and helpful for us today. That maybe that we would move past our regret. That we would uh, take upon the pattern of, of you, God. Of how that we would face regret. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the prophet Samuel was very faithful from this very get-go, you know. He didn't know a lot in his, in his background about hearing from God, but whenever he did it, uh, I think that it got into his blood. I think that he, he, he loved the taste of God's word. He loved, it, it, it tingled in his ears, just like that it said last week, week uh, in our passage of scripture, that every time that God spoke, that it tingled in his ears until it didn't. But even when it didn't, it's still good news. Because you hear this passage of scripture that whenever God said, I regretted making Saul king, did you see Samuel's heart? It's almost like that Samuel's heart broke for the same thing that God's heart was broken for. He says, God says, I regret it. And then Samuel over here in turn, hears this news that God's heart is broken. So therefore Samuel's heart is just absolutely crushed at the same time. Lord, let's make that our prayer today as church. Uh, very simply, I'm not going to spend much more time on that. But God, break our heart for what breaks yours. That whenever you cry over things, whenever your heart is broken, God, let our hearts be broken in, in, as well. And let us respond. But one of the things that, that I don't know about you, but um, whenever I see this King Saul, um, whenever I hear description about him, I think about this head over all men's head type of tall type of guy big burly you know he looked the part Saul did Saul looked the part muscular I mean he probably could be on the cover of a romance novel could be uh, show me your romance novels and I'll show you mine <laughs> sorry no I don't have none uh, but the deal is, is that, that Saul did look the part and what he did hear from the Lord. God was the one that anointed him and he received that anointing. It was a new anointing. It was a new day. And Saul had every opportunity to lead the people. And so as the people had cried out to, to God and said, give us a king. Samuel was the first one to say, you know, I hear the, the heartbeat of God. And he's like, I know that you think that you want this, but I think that you're going to regret it. Because here's what's going to end up happening. He's going to, if you want a king, let me just find it real quick. I, I think I, here it is. Yeah. He says, I'm going to take your sons, and I'm going to put them in the infantry. I'm going to, you're, I'm going to put them in the military, and I'm going to send them out to battle. If, if you want a king, that's what's going to happen. You know what else he's going to do? He's going to take your daughters. He's going to make them perfumists. He's going to make them bank, and he's going to use them and change their job description to fit his particular needs. You don't want that. You want to know what else that he's going to do? He's going to take your property, and he's going to give them to his friends. And the last thing that he's going to do is he's going to take all the produce of the property that you have. He's going to ask you to give it to him, and he's going to use it for whatever desire that he has. Are you sure that you want this? Yes, give us a king. Well, okay. So here it is. Here's Saul. And here's the thing about Saul. He looked the part. He had the anointing from God. He had the approval from God. He had the opportunity to hear and to lead well. And you want to know what he did? He kept on turning his ears off. He kept on saying no to God. 
He kept on ignoring God, although that he would hear it. And he turned to his own way. Instead of God being the Lord over the king, the king became the king. God had a problem with that. So there's something that just seems a little weird. Maybe even sacrilegious that if you were in a place of discussion where people were kind of, I don't know, searching characteristic of God, and you would say, you know, God regretted. You know, there's another time in a passage of scripture, you know, 10 stars to anybody that would be able to tell me where is the other place in scripture that you hear that phrase, God regretted. Anybody? Anybody? Genesis? Yes? Want to narrow it down any? I'll give you some extra points. No? Yeah, yeah, he that's Genesis chapter six. Absolutely, Joan gets ten stars. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, we can tell you've been reading your Bible, so appreciate that. Uh, it says, "The Lord saw how great the wickedness of man was, and he had, and the man had every intent of evil in his heart. And at that time, the Lord regretted that he had made." And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will write from the face of the earth, human race. I've created with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that moved along the ground. For I regretted that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So obviously it's a little bit unnerving to hear these, this passage of scripture a couple of times. Not just once. I mean, once we might be able to kind of, you know, brush it underneath the rug. Twice. Okay, a couple of times. And I think really what our temptation is whenever we hear this is like you look inwardly and you say, I've regretted. I get that. I wonder if God ever regretted making me. I've made mistakes. I mean, I fit into the category of that. I've had moments in my life where every inclination of my heart was tuned and turned to me. God, have you ever thought that about me? But I think the biblical authors are wanting to redirect. Whenever they use the term, he regretted, or God regretted, I really think that the, the tension was, is that although that God is regretful, the biblical authors didn't stray away from the characteristic that God was good, or God had our best intention in mind. Really, to me, and this is not the biblical author, but maybe to me, to hear the phrase, God regretted, doesn't make him unapproachable. I think he makes it, it makes him more real. The God that I serve is capable of, of, of feeling remorse and regret. So, with that being said, you know, there's some, some people, and I believe that we can relate with that that relate with regret. Um, there's people that that, uh, that come on a Sunday morning, every single morning, and I think that maybe the, the tension of trying to come to a service or even join us online um, and, and just making that a habit is maybe there is some past that informs us that regret is kind of informing our current position. You'll hear people uh, once that I, that I my, my hope and my prayer is that the, the, the church finds safety and, and security and finds solitude and, and, and freedom in a program called Celebrate Recovery, where not just simple addiction, but sometimes anger and past abuse is, is being a tool of Satan to keep people in bounds and shackles. And I can tell you one thing certain that those situations can keep the best disciples in shackles and chains. And so really what it is is that sometimes people say, you know, I'm going to be involved in alcohol, you know, drugs, or for that matter, I, I want to be really, I want to get in tight and in bed with my anger. I want to coddle it. I want to come in. And when you think that I can control it, but what you really find out 
is that those things, although that you think you're going to lord over them, it's a sneaky, sneaky thing. And whenever that table is turned, and those things become lord over your life, and they can completely crush you and put you in shackles and chains. You know, there's some people that that turn to consumerism as the king of their life. You know, the be- the best, the biggest. Those particular things, the biggest house, you know, the best landscaping, you know, uh, the, the best vacations, you know. Not only can I have my house, but I can also have my beach home. I know I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here this morning. <laughs> but, you know, that can be king over your life. And I can just tell you the king that ruled over my life that was not Jesus Christ. The king that ruled over my life was me. There was a a moment in time where I was unsurrendered. And I thought that I knew best. And so therefore, you know who could tell me what to do? Me. And, and come to find out, me being the king over my life, the only thing that I would do is mess things up. Not only would I mess my life up, but I would mess things up for the people that were closest to me, whenever me was the king of me. So, different people, different regrets, causes people to have this memory in their mind like it's a, a rewinding tape. But you know, it's interesting to me whenever I look at the regret of God in both cases, in Genesis and now, is it always finds hope. There's always light at the other end of God's regret. And I think that, you know, sometimes, although that that, that topic of regret paralyzes us, sometimes it does the opposite effect. I've had people over and over again uh, message me and say, you know, I've got no regrets. Only mistakes in which that I learned from. And I think that that's the opposite effect, and that's a great effect. I don't got no regrets. I'm going to pick myself up, and I'm, it's not going to stop me from moving forward. But there's certain people that I believe what regret does is that it paralyzes them into being unwilling to make that very next step. And that therefore that they are stuck in a past regret so that they cannot move anywhere forward, that it seems like that they are walking forward, looking back. So anybody that has ever coached baseball before, um, I'm learning this out, uh, finding this out, second season of, of, of coach pitch. Um, I'm learning a lot of things. One is that uh, my 80-mile-an-hour fastball uh, probably doesn't work well with six- and eight-year-olds. Um, people are reminding me that all the time, Cassandra. <clears throat> but uh, um, what I'm also finding out, and it's, it's true for even the best athletes in the world, um, that it, I don't know if you've discovered this or not, but if you've got up to the plate, um, I'm not going to call anybody out because I, I've seen this even with the people that are in this room. Even with the, set, the best athletes in the world that's got the most ability, that they would get up to the plate, and they would strike out, and they are worthless the rest of the game. It's like that they can't get over that one play. You know, the ball that went between their legs or the pop fly that was so easy that for somehow it just had to spin on it and just kind of popped out of your glove. You know what coaches say to try to get them out of that funk? Come on, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. And they just can't seem to shake it off. No one. No, no amount of, of coaching or positivity can say, in your regret, come on, just shake it off. Just shake it off. Have you ever found that helpful? Whenever you have deep-seated regrets for somebody to say, you know what you just need to do? You just need to get over it. The most empty word sometimes for somebody that is facing regrets is that phrase. You just need to get over it. You just need to put your big boy pants on and just walk forward. You know, all good intentions in mind. Regret is deep-seated and needs the help of the Savior. Regret is painful and needs the help of the great physician to help us get over it. Even adults, we have the same issue. We are No matter what age that you might be, you might be still living in the regret of a childhood pain. I'm I'm reading some of these other regrets. Check this out. Sherry Bordner, 
she is she has been transparent on this Facebook thread, and she was willing to confess this. She says, "I I regret being angry and fearful of my abusers for so long." Gary, she's a pastor's wife in Tologa. It's interesting that sometimes the things that are happening as a child, you know. Danny Thompson, she writes, she's allowing the world to make me negative whenever I was younger. Um, I was so grateful for a, my pastor friend, uh, Dane Robinson. He says, the years I spent doing drugs and all the, that comes with life, lying, eating, stealing, hurting, the people who love you the most and breaking their trust. It takes years to repair, if ever. And the last one, Kaylee Blackburn, she was a student in, in my youth ministry at Camp Creek and Viceside. She says that. I thought about this all day long. I cried tears thinking about it, to be honest, but I think I've got it. I regret living, I regret giving anyone power over me, my work, my thoughts, my rent in my head, whom I didn't deserve and whom they didn't deserve an ounce of me. And I'm thankful to this day that I don't question my work. For it's found in Yahweh, and only Yahweh. Powerful, powerful stuff right there. You know, I think it's for God, I think it's good news for us to know that God was not stuck in his regret because this is what God could have done. In Genesis chapter 6, he could have said, you guys blew it. Every single one of you blew it. I'm done with you. And that's kind of what regret had the temptation, for, even for God, that, that he could have said, I want, but you know that there was a glimmer of hope. Anytime that there's a glimmer of, of light and hope, God says, I can use that. And he used Noah. And it's the same response as Samuel's heart is broken. God says, I regret that I made king. I think he could have possibly just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with it. I'm done with these people. And I get to thinking, God, really? You're going to say that now? I mean, look at, look at what, a, what your people have done up to this point in time. And now, just because that you have uh, king, but you know what he doesn't do? He looks at Samuel as, as, as he is just kind of wailing and mourning and, and crying and saying, Oh, I, I, I'm so sorrowful for this nation. Look where our nation has come. Kind of reminds you of the current situation. And God says to Samuel, how long? How long are you going to sit there? Are you going to mope and like a baseball player that uh, blew the game and he's worthless the rest, of the, the rest of the game? How long are you going to sit there and mope and cry? God's like, I'm over it. I'm going to get a new plan. So Samuel, what you do, you get your horn of oil. And really what that meant is that God was going to do a new thing. That horn of oil was the same horn of oil that he anointed Saul as king and as God has rejected him. And he says, Samuel, get that oil. What that represented is God's about to do a new thing. And I think that gave Samuel a glimmer of hope. He's like, oh, okay. What's next, God? He says, I want you to go to Jesse. And there I'm going to anoint a new king. And so as, as Samuel goes to, to Jesse, he, he sees the strapping. Beautiful specimen that could possibly be a king. And so he's like, oh, is this one God? And God's like, nope, that's not him. Oh, this one, this one, this one's a good one. Boy, you got some good genes, Jesse. God says, nope, not that one. And he goes down the line, and, and, and there's nobody else that is present. And, and Jesse's like, hey, you don't see nothing you like? <laughs> and uh, Samuel's like, well, God... God, I know that he's called me here. You got any other king or other other son? And he's like, yeah, he's out tending. He's out being faithful to his father. He's out tending the sheep. He's tending the flock. He says, he says, do you want David? You want him? He says, absolutely. So they run a game, and David comes. And you want to know what he looks like? He don't look the part. I mean, we we think of you know. The, the cover of Bodybuilder magazine is the David type. You know, we think of, of Saul, David. 
I mean, you you remember this that whenever he went to to fight Goliath and he, and Saul's like, you know, you can use my armor and it's just sagging on him. It's like droopy clothes after that you had like forty days of fasting. Kind of what I feel like right now. I mean, just nothing fits right. He doesn't look the part. And I think that God has in his mind this conversation as he is regretting making an anointing Saul king. I think he has this, I think he has this inner dialogue. And this inner dialogue is it goes like this. I regret making Saul king. You know, I, I regret giving what the people asked for. And they got this king. This is this useless. He's not even a vocal mouthpiece for me. You know what? They're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them what they ask for, but not what they ask for. I'm going to give them the king that they need. And so you know what Scripture says about David? David is this man after God's own heart. Did David make mistakes? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's plastered all over. I mean, there's movies made about, you know, his, his mistakes. You know, there's murder, there's adultery. If you talk about it, a guy after God's own heart, and he's got this picture painted of him, it should tell you a little bit about God's grace and mercy, too. But God has this inner dialogue. I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you need. So this horn of oil is poured on, on David. And I can tell you there's some good news. That God is not stuck in his regret. That God, if God is not stuck in his regret, the good news for you is that you don't have to be either. So I get to thinking about, I don't, I wasn't there, and I don't know what was the inner dialogue that God had with himself. And I, I, I may be just making it up, but it doesn't make it any less true. But there becomes another Roman Empire, another oppression, another... Uh, Oppression over the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel in secretive is calling for a king. Would you reestablish your throne? Send us the Messiah. We want a Messiah. And here Jesus walks into the scene. And you know what they expect of him? He's head and shoulders over people. He's going to pull out his sword. He's going to ride on a horse. And he's going to knock people's heads off with an iron fist with a sword he's going to reestablish his kingdom and he's going to rule on earth this inner dialogue with God says I know what you want I'm going to give you a king that you need and Jesus steps on the scene and he doesn't come with a violence he comes as the king and the prince of peace he comes not riding on a horse, but riding on a donkey. And you want to know what his throne was? It was a cross. That he would be willing to die for his friends. That's the peace. That was the punishment that brought our peace. He, God says, I know what you want. You need a king. This is what you need. You need somebody that's going to be able to cover your sin. You're going to need a, a king that is going to usher in a movement and not a, a king that is going to be militant and bring in violence. He's going to bring in peace, and he is going to rule and reign in each and every believer's heart, and he's going to send a revival with his Holy Spirit because the church is going to be alive and well. I can tell you what, I don't know about you, but I find it liberating to hear a God in the midst of his regrets that doesn't get stuck in his past, begins to step forward and say, I've got this plan and I know what's better for you. For so long, you've lived as the king of your life. For so long, maybe some of you have, have bought into the lie that I know what's best, that you know what's best. And I think it's the same type of dialogue that you would have to say, God, why don't you just take control? Carrie Underwood got it wrong, y'all. Nowhere in Scripture do you say, see that Jesus actually takes the will. Because the truth of the matter is, you're in the driver's seat at all times. 
Travis Tatton didn't come on the air whenever you were driving, did it? Jesus take the wheel. Okay, I'll just take a nap real quick. <laughs> if you didn't know, Travis uh, something else to celebrate. Travis had survived, and Trevin, his son, survived a really, really bad wreck in which that he fell asleep. So praise God uh, for that. For so long, he's if you want to if you want to find a different king, God allows it. If you want to serve yourself, so be it. If you're, if you're stuck in regret and saying, you know what, I, I, I've done my thing, and so I'm going to try my best to, in my own strength and in my own power to make it right, God's like, you can do that, but I know what you need. I've got a key. That if you just remove whatever that might be from the throne of your heart, you just kind of make way and clear space. Allow somebody else to sit on the decision-making seat of your, your life, the, the throne of your life, the throne of your heart. I've got not what you want, but what you need. Don't you find it interesting that in life, those things are in opposition sometimes? Things that you want versus things that you need. It's no greater picture than to look at the cross and look to Jesus because sometimes you will find that those things are in opposition. And whenever you're hit with the truth of the gospel, sometimes those things clash. Let me say, if you find certain things unnerving, don't fight them. When you, whenever you're faced with truth, and maybe it might be today, and maybe it might be a future seed for you just to think this, that whenever you're faced with absolute truth that comes from the wisdom of, of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, don't fight it. Even though that it's unnerving, even though that it's stirring some stuff up inside of you that you just don't like, maybe God's trying to do something. Maybe just maybe that God has called somebody to grab the horn of oil. And maybe today that he's coming to you today and saying, you know what, there's a fresh new anointing today. There's a fresh new understanding today of what God's doing, and I want you to embrace this. Because although that you might be living in past regrets, God's going to bring a fresh new oil, a fresh new anointing, and an awakening. What new thing that you might be able to We got a God. We got a God that uh, that doesn't get stuck in His past and in His regret. And I think it's so liberating to know that you don't have to get stuck in your past. I think a lot of regrets have to do with timing. Um, like I wish that I didn't send that text message, or I wish that I I didn't say those things, or I wish I didn't post those things because you can't get those things back and there's a rift in relationships. I think that there's a lot of people, Monica Stevenson says this, he says, not serving the Lord 100% since I was saved. Linda Hicks, she says this, she says, not applying myself in high school. It has everything to do with timing. Melody, you willing to let me share? It's okay, you post it on Facebook, you might as well do it in church. Well, I regret the most of my life was wasting so much time. Hear that? Being angry of the things I couldn't control from me for so long and not letting go and giving it to God. Marianne Phillips, not raising my kids in church. You hear time? Time wasted, time spent. And Tanya uh, Mangram says this all the time that I've wasted. What is today's date? Anybody know? Can you tell me? 14th, 14th of, of June. I would hate. For anybody to use this day as a day that you would look back and say, I regret it when I heard from God and he's given me a new opportunity from my regret to release me from my regret that I did not respond. I would hate years from now and saying, I wasted so much time. June 14th, I remember God spoke to me so clearly. 
He raised a new horn of oil and he said, here is a new opportunity for you to break the chains of regret and move forward to a new, new future. I would hate for anybody today to say, I missed out on my opportunity. There was my opportunity and I did not respond. But I believe today, that's uh, that's the message for us today. Leah's going to sing a song that's, uh, that's very powerful that, that talks about in God's house, in the midst of His presence, that shame and regret has no space. Now that's true for anybody that is willing to allow it to happen. God has made every provision for it to happen today. Today! Not in a couple of weeks. Oh, I'm going to warm up to it. The door is wide open. I'm going to invite you to stand. If you'd like to come, I'll be willing to, to talk with you and pray with you if you want to use the song to respond. But if you'd like to just use it as a space for you just to, to sing, these two altars right up here that you want me to pray for you, lay hands on you, over here on the sides, or it's just simply a place that you can just find to pray. And you don't need anybody at all other than just you want to be alone with God and get right. Let's sing together. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over But my story's just begun I feel you won't define me Cause that's what my father does I feel you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Same at the door, sitting with them anymore. Ooh. 
sing in this song together. There won't be lyrics on the screen, but I invite you to listen to the words of these songs, of the song, to pray, to do whatever God is leading you to do. Um, as Pastor Payson was talking about who is the king of our lives and our heart, this song was laid on my heart. And so I want to share this with you. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, for he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, for he is my son. Cause you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, good, oh, let the key God has done a work in the ones that needed it. Uh, this morning, before that we leave, I just want to give us a benediction a verse. And I just pray that you receive it and hear these words from Jude chapter 1. It says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be the glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Amen. May you go without regret. Amen. We'll get to fellowship with you guys outside. If you guys would like to join us again, whether tomorrow night, Celebrate Recovery, 630, or Tuesday night at 6 o'clock for prayer led by Dylan Ford. We'd like for you guys to come and, and receive prayer that way. God bless you and keep you. you go.